Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. We talked about this passage a little bit last week. And what we're told there, the Apostle Paul writing to the Romans, he says, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. And the word conquerors here, or victors, or overcomers, is uh, the Greek word Nike. And it just, it just makes that passage kind of come to life, you know. Uh, you just put on your Nikes. Um, I love it, uh, Nike, when they came up with that slogan, you know, just do it. It's like, uh, it's like what the Lord is calling us to hear. You're more than a conqueror, just do it. Um, so you know, the idea of being a conqueror or being an overcomer is, uh, is so critical in Scripture. The Lord's called us to be more than conquerors. He says, you're more than a conqueror. Not just a conqueror, but the word here, more than, is the idea, he puts that prefix in front of conquerors and says, you're, you're a, a conqueror just wins, but the victory's already been given to you. You've already won the match. You've already conquered in life. You're, it's already done for you because Jesus died on the cross for you. God's already paved the way. We have been made more than conquerors. So I love this whole idea. So when we go through and we look at scripture, we see the idea that, that we are, we can overcome in this life because Jesus has already wrought the victory. And by faith, if we put our trust in him, then we are going to, we're gonna conquer and we're gonna be victorious and we're going to overcome. Revelation chapter 21 says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And we know that we're going to overcome because we've put our trust and put our faith in Jesus. And that's the only way you overcome this world. First John, John the Apostle writes in chapter 5 of 1 John, he says, For whatever is born of God, that's us, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We put our faith in Jesus, and uh, we are victorious. We are conquerors. Actually, we're more than conquerors, as the Apostle Paul tells us. You know, we meet many people in Scripture who are overcomers, who have put their faith in God Almighty who are in the Old Testament, they're waiting for the Messiah, uh, who in the New Testament, they have said, Jesus, he is the one, and they have become overcomers. They overcome trials, they overcome persecution, they overcome unjust laws and the rulers of the day. When the Apostle Paul uh, wrote this, uh, he, we're overcomers, when he wrote Romans, and he said, you're more than conquerors, and that was actually at a time when Caesar Nero was the emperor of the day. And Nero was, uh, oh, he was a godless man. Um, he was uh, a man who was married a number of times. I think he had three wives and two husbands. And so, I mean, it was very strange, his, uh, his, his relationships. Uh, one of his wives... Uh, she was pregnant and she died in pregnancy and it was thought that she didn't just die but he, he hastened her departure. And uh, after she was dead, then he took a, uh, a man by the name of, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but took this guy and had him castrated. He looked like a lot like his wife. And from that point on, he called this man who had been castrated who he took as his wife, um, he called him by her name. So a very strange time, very strange time, and into all of this, and it was, it was under the, uh, the, the leadership of, of Nero in the Roman Empire that so many Christians lost their lives, and the Apostle Paul would actually stand before Caesar Nero, he would actually be put to death under the reign of Caesar Nero. But he says, in all of this, in all of the persecutions, in all of the trials, 
We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And it's so true. And, and uh, so we're conquerors. And, and I want to, in looking at uh, Job, uh, I see a man from the Old Testament who overcame overwhelming difficulties. And it's because he had, he had such great faith. He trusted God. And if you're going to go through difficulties, if you're going to go through trials, that's, that's the victory. You're going to be an overcomer because of, of your faith. And we see that. We see it in uh, Job chapter 1 and verse 1. It starts out and it tells us about this man, Job. It says, in the land of Uz, not Oz, that's the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright and he feared God. And he shunned evil. So I love this description of this man, so succinct. Right there we understand who Job is, there in Job chapter 1 and verse 1. And we see this man who trusts God, and he's a man of faith. And, uh, you know, Job, interestingly, we would think that that the book of Genesis would have been the first book written in the Bible. But it's actually, it's actually Job. This is the first book that was written. And I think God just wanted us to understand right at the, right at the outset. I care through, about the things that you go through. I care about your struggles. And I want to show you how, uh, how I care for those and how you can deal with them. So we have Job's faith in verse 1. And, and then in verses uh, 2... Down through five, we see Job's family. So we have his faith. We see what kind of man he was. Now we look at his family. And it said that he had seven sons and three daughters. He had ten children. This man was blessed. He had a quiver full of arrows. It says this, his sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays. And they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them, which is pretty cool. I mean, we're the first book of the Bible, and we see this family unit, this Job's family. And it wasn't like, all right, we've got the boys over here, girls, you're not invited. It's like the, he just puts it here. Boy, when they had these celebrations and 10 kids, you'd have these birthday celebrations. And so it was like almost once a month, they're getting together to have some kind of a party and they're inviting everybody, all the boys, all the girls were coming. And when a period of feasting had run its course, so it wasn't just a day, this was a period of feasting, Job, would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice burnt offerings for each of them, <coughs> thinking perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So we see Job's family, and um, we haven't met his wife yet. We'll meet her a little later on. But uh, he loved his children, and he thought, you know, I'm just going to continue to go before God for them because, you know, on the outside things look good, but I don't know what's going on in their hearts. I want to make sure that I'm lifting them up to the Lord and uh, uh, offering, you know, a heartfelt prayer for them. So we have, uh, we have Job's faith, and then we see his family. But uh, take a look there at verses 3. Verse 3 is, talks about his fortune. Uh, he, had a, he had an amazing fortune. It says he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. And then it says he was the greatest man among all the people of the East, there in, in uh, the land of Uz, which would be in the uh, Middle East there, the area of, uh, of Iraq, Iran, right in that area is where we're talking about. So of all the people of that day, it says that Job was the greatest among them. He had, he had so much. He even had some friends. So we see his faith, we see his family, we see his uh, fortune, and we see his friends 
also here, we see the, his friends in chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. And you might remember Job's three friends. Things start out well with his three friends. They're not going to end so well. But it says in verse 11, when Job's three friends, now I'm sure he had more friends, but these are three that were very close to him. It says Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, Zophar. <laughs> Just remember, the movie Big, wasn't it Zophar? That he, that he went and it was in the machine, Zophar. Zophar, the Naamathite, heard about all the troubles uh, that had come upon him. They set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. Great thing. What a great thing that these friends decided to do. Let's just go and let's just be there for him. And uh, let's just comfort him. You know? It says when they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. And they began to weep aloud. And they tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. I love that. I love that. It's like, you know, sometimes you just don't know what to say to a friend who is hurting. I mean, they're going through something. Maybe he's lost at this point in the story. He has lost everything. And it, it's... He's had huge trials, and I'll talk to you about those trials in just a minute. But these trials have been overwhelming. He's lost his family, ten, all ten of his children. So what, what can you do to comfort someone in that way? And that what they do is just to sit with them. Sometimes that's all you can do. It's just all you can do is just sit with someone and be near them. Just be near them. Uh, they're going to they're gonna mess up here in just a little bit, but... That was, that was how it all started, and it all started good. Well, we also have someone else in the story. Besides, the, besides Job and his family and his uh, fortune, we have, we have the accuser. And uh, the accuser is, the, the, the word Satan means accuser. And we see him here in the very first book that was written for us in scripture, and we see what he does. It says, one day the angels came to present themselves before God. And this is after the fall. And, but you still see Satan has access to heaven. And he can still go in before God. And it says that uh, when the angels are presenting themselves before God, and they're coming, and they're worshiping, and they're bowing down, it says, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Where have you been, Satan? What's been going on? Satan answered the Lord, oh, so I've been roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And that's what Satan does. I mean, we're told that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And he goes about as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And if he's going back and forth upon the earth, it's not just him. Because we're told that a third of the angels, he swept out of heaven with him. Those are his demons. And it says, you know, he's going back and forth and he has his angels who are here upon the earth. And uh, it, undoubtedly, we have had many brushes with the enemy. We're told in Ephesians, you remember that great passage in Ephesians chapter 6, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers, the spiritual forces of darkness in heavenly places. And that's right here, everything that we're going through. It's just, there's a battle that's going on. There's a spiritual battle. And Satan is going back and forth through this world, roaming, it says, roaming throughout the earth. And God tells us that right here at the beginning. So we're told in the New Testament, since that's what he's doing, we need to put on the full armor of God, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And 
you know, Job did that. He was a man who was, who was righteous and, and who feared God. He put on the breastplate of righteousness. He put on the armor of God. The breastplate, the belt of truth. Um, he had the helmet of salvation. He was actually, I'm waiting for the Messiah. I'm waiting. This is what God can do. And I'm waiting for the Messiah. And uh, taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and shield of faith. These things, Job was was doing something the Apostle Paul would write about later. So it says, then, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. Oh my, wouldn't you love to have the Lord say that about you? There's no one, there's no one like him. He trusts me. He has faith in me. He loves me. He walks righteously before me. And you know, that's, that's the one that, that's the one that uh, Satan wants to get a hold of. And Satan, now, in his, in his way, he says, well, you must, you put a hedge around him. You put a hedge around him, God, you put a hedge around his household, everything he has. You blessed his hands, the work of his hands, so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand, strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Uh, interesting here, Satan has to ask God for what he can do. God has, God is in control of everything. And for Satan to be able to do anything, he has to, he has to get permission. And that's truly the place today. It's, you know, in, in Satan's attack upon us, God is using that testing and that trial to be a, something that's going to grow us. It's what he does here in Job's life. As bad as it was, we find that Job is going to, he's going to seek out in a different light at the end of all of this. And through it all, he's going to be faithful, but he's going to be, he's going to be tested and he's going to be blessed. The testings of God are meant to strengthen us and they're meant to make us more like Jesus. Now, some of the testings we go through are horrible. And I don't know anybody who was tested in a, in a bigger way than, than Job. But we're going to see in the end of all of this the blessings of God, what he does through this. So he's tested. And when you see him tested, these trials that he goes through, you see, first of all, he, all of the stuff that he had, I mean, he's going to lose it all. It says, one day Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sebians attacked and made off with them. And they put the servants uh, to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, Fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. So, and, and, he, and he continues, and I mean, there's even more. It says, while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raid parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants uh, to the sword. And I'm the only one who is left to escape and tell you. And while he's speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking at your oldest brother's house. When suddenly a, a mighty wind uh, swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house and it collapsed on them and they are dead and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. So we see this, it's, it's uh, all the livestock have been destroyed. And, and we see that in each one of these cases, the servants have been killed also, but one servant comes to the house to tell Job, 
this is, this is the message. And not only that, but we see his sons and daughters. I mean, the wind swept, swept in, and the house falls, and all of them are in the house, and they're all killed. All ten, seven sons, and the three daughters. The servant, one servant, survives and goes and tells Job what's going on. I mean, it doesn't even stop there. I mean, he has lost his, his very heart. And, and I, there are many people who at this point would just say, I give up, I quit. I, I am not going to go through this any longer. And Job continues to be <clears throat> looking to God in all of this. And it says in chapter 2 and verse 7, or chapter 1, it says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. And his wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, of all the things that Satan took, he took his sons and daughters. He took his, all the herds he had, the stock. He took uh, uh, his servants. He took his health. Here we see in this passage. But he left his wife. And she's not very encouraging here. I mean, I'm sure she's hurting herself. I mean, everything's gone. The children that she loves so dearly. and She just says, you know, why are you holding on? Just curse God and die. Just curse God and die. I'm sure she is very upset, very angry at God. And she's going, look at you. Why don't you just die? It'd be easier for you just to die. So I don't know if I want to. A lot of people are really, um, they have a hard time with Job's wife and said, well, she should have been taken out of the whole thing too. It would have been better if she had been in the house and when all the kids were there, maybe she would have been gone too. But I, I, I don't see it that way. I see her as a woman who's, very, who's hurting very much. Um... So, what do we see with Job after all of this loss? Um, we get to the very end of the book of Job, and Job, Job says this, after, after God, after Job's friends, they are going to spend many chapters just telling Job their thoughts. You know, after it started out so well, then they come in, they sit down with him, and they go, Job, must be some secret sin in your life. I mean, God wouldn't do this to you if it wasn't for some secret sin in your life, so you need to repent. And that goes on and on and on. And finally, God shows up, and God says, uh, that's not right. Job, you've been faithful, and this counsel has been just dark counsel. It's been wrong. And then when you get to chapter 42, we're told there, Job says, I know you can do everything. Lord, you can do everything. I don't understand it. He says, and there's no purpose of yours. Uh, no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. I don't get it. I don't understand it, Lord. I don't understand your purposes, but I know that you can do everything. And you, you lift up and you bring down. And uh, nothing, nothing is impossible with you, Lord. Uh, four times in Scripture we read, nothing is impossible with God. And uh, truly, when we get to the New Testament, and, you know, uh, we see that passage in Luke 1, 37. And uh, the angels come to Mary and said, you're going you're gonna to be the mother of the Messiah. Jesus, you're going to be the mother of Jesus. And uh, she says, oh, nothing, nothing is impossible with God. <clears throat> so Job learns this at the end of his life, or at the end, you know, chapter 42, and says, no one can be compared to our God when it comes to blessing. Job at the end of his life, after all of this, we see God blessing him. And... Uh, Job makes three statements. 
I love the three statements that Job makes. And they're statements of faith. And if you're going to be an overcomer, it, it's, it's, it's by faith. Those who overcome the world, this is the victory that overcomes the world. It's, it's our faith. And Job says this. In Job, and I'll give you three. He says in chapter 13 and verse 15, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Job was a man of hope. And he had hope because he knew. He knew God. And he, maybe he doesn't understand all of the things that he's going through. But he knows his God and he knows his Father loves him. And so he has this hope. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 says, This is my prayer for you. I pray that you would know the hope that is in Christ Jesus. I, know, I pray that you know the inheritance and that you know the power. That, but he begins that by saying, I pray that you would know the hope. The hope. Do you know the hope? Do you know the hope that is in Jesus? Because if you, if you have that hope, that hope as it's an anchor in heaven for us, if you have that hope, then truly you're going to make it through the worst of days. If you lose hope, then, then you're going to fall off course. It's all about the hope. He says, he has another statement that he makes. He says uh, in Job 23 and verse 10, he says, But God knows the way I take. When he tested me, I will come, when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Job knew this one thing, and it's what the Apostle Paul tells us before he says, you're more than conquerors, you're, you're an overcomer. He says, uh, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 28, he says, all things, all things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And that is Old Testament and that is New Testament. And Job understood that. He says, I know. Um, God knows the way that I'm going. I don't. I know that when he has tested me, he says, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to come forth like pure gold. He's the refiner. It's a refiner's fire. And, and I don't get it. I don't understand everything that I'm going through here. But he's taking me through this, and I'm going to come forth as pure as gold. Refiner's fire. Refiner's fire. Um, there's a beautiful passage in Jeremiah where he talks about um, Moab. And Moab has been poured from vessel to vessel because God is purifying the people of Moab. And as it, it was like wine and the dredges and I might talk about that later. Not right now. I want to give you one other statement of Job. It's, it's the triumph of Job. And, and he says this. He says in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. And again, we see just the faith. We have faith, the hope, and the love. It's truly really what he's saying. This, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. Oh, it's just beautiful. I mean, he's looking for, I don't know what revelation that God gave him, but he sees Jesus. He sees the Lord, and he says, after my skin has been destroyed, and he's probably thinking right at this time, it's not going to be long, but after my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. He says, I know I'm going to die. And I know my body is going to go into the grave. And I know that my flesh is going to be destroyed. And I know this too, that I will be raised from the dead. What, what faith, what faith this man has. No wonder he's an overcomer. No wonder he's more than a conqueror with the faith that he has. He says, my heart yearns within me 
My heart yearns within me. Uh, the Apostle Paul would say, just before his own death, he'd say, I'm looking forward to it. I, I can't wait to be with Jesus. Uh, and and I, I long for his appearing. And any of you, any of you who long for his appearing, you're going to receive a crown. And I know I'm going to receive a crown. And I can't wait for me to live as Christ to die. He says, that's gain. What a beautiful picture of Job in this passage. Jesus, thank you. He's a man of faith and he's an overcomer because of that faith. And we can be, I mean, he's just a picture for us so that we can be more than conquerors. Jesus has made us to be more than conquerors, so let's be overcomers in this life.